I would say don't clap yet, right? Because you don't know. It's like you should wait to the end. But I do appreciate that. That was exciting. Um, thank you, JT. That was so perfect. The yoga breathing he had you doing, it's such a great lead in. So I'm actually going to talk, I actually call it the informal breath for deregulating the nervous system, which is awesome. But what I like to start with before I do any of my presentations, whether I'm at the university or I'm out getting to speak with folks like you, is we do a what's good. So I want you to take a minute and I want you to share with these amazing people at your table, what is one thing that's good today? Anything, it could be that you had that great cup of coffee, maybe you slept in a little bit later, but what is good for you today? Go ahead, this is your time to talk. And I know there's people at your table because I can see them. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, I think like figure out how to. Are you okay? Oh sure, sure. That'd be great. Oh, much. Thank you. Two seconds to get back there. Okay. Okay, about 20 more seconds. What is good today? What is good today? I, I got to tell you, you guys are really good talkers. I was really impressed by that. I was hearing some great conversations going on. So here's that moment. Who wants to share? Who wants to share what's good today? Oh, this is when it gets really quiet, even in my classes. They all avoid eye contact. <gasps> what's good? You woke up with a... Yeah, yeah, isn't that so true? I woke up with a pulse, and I have to add to this. I teach, um, in addition to my courses, my undergrad and grad, I get to teach for the Lifelong Learning Institute through ASU is for retirees. And so in a couple of sessions ago, I actually had a 97-year-old woman in my course. And I asked, well, what's good today? And she's like, I woke up. And I'm like, you know what? It is. It's all perspective, right? So that's perfect. What else is good? Got here safe. Okay, you got here safely, right? That you're here and you're at this amazing conference and you get to share with everybody else in this room. So that's a definite what's good. What else? Who else wants to share what's good? Eight yeah. hours of CE. Eight hours of CE, is that good? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're like, yes, it is good, right? It's all in how we frame it. <laughs> okay, excellent. And what else is good? I was gonna say sobriety. Sobriety, absolutely. Absolutely, that's good. That definitely deserves some applause. So. Thank you, first of all, everybody who shared, but why would I start everything I do with the what's good? What, what am I trying to do? Okay. Reframe the brain, set the mood. I'm good. I can Trust me, I can get my backpacks. I'm pretty good, right, in the, in the classroom. So that's exactly what we're doing, because if we look at the brain and we look at how really our behavior has evolved, that when we have tendencies, when we hit triggers or stressful events in our lives, we have a tendency to default on fear and anxiety. It's a survival mechanism, right? It's survival behavior. So, and imagine a scenario that this morning you had enough time to stop and get your favorite beverage. That could have been Starbucks, could have been Dutch Brothers, could have been Circle K, right? Wherever you're going. But you get your favorite drink, you get in the car, you're like, I'm excited, I got this great conference, I've got my favorite drink. You start driving, the guy in front of you slams on their brakes, your drink goes everywhere. Now, okay, make noises, you guys, your drink just went everywhere. Uh. Yeah, yeah, right? And I'm sure there's some language we couldn't even be saying right now that would be coming out, correct? Because that would be a really frustrating moment. And so what I'd want to challenge you to do in that situation is say, oh my gosh, this makes me so mad and sad and everything else that you're feeling, right? Those are very valid emotions. But then I want you to ask yourself, what's good? Because it's interesting, when we hit triggers like that, and be honest, when you've hit a bad trigger, maybe in the morning or later on, have you ever thought to yourself, oh my gosh, this is an omen for how the rest of my day is going to go, right? This is it. This is where I'm at. Have you ever thought that? I mean, I have. And so, what was that? There you go. The universe. <laughs> I love it. So, but that's it. So instead of though defaulting and continuing in this track of negativity, I'm challenging you to do the what's good to find the positive because there's a lot. No doubt there are challenges in life, but we had a blessing in life too. You woke up. You had an opportunity to buy that drink. You had a job or a conference to go to. And so by doing that what's good, you're training the brain to start scouring the world for the positive, not just the negative, not just the threats. Because really, 
you think about this, you guys, you're in, you're in a career. You guys are in, you are literally in the highest purpose that there is, and it's service to others. And it's service to others at a lot of times as a detriment to you. And so it's really easy, I mean, listening to that last thing when you're hearing this call, it's really easy to fall into these negative tracks. But you don't fight darkness with darkness. You don't. And so being able to say what's good, it's that opportunity for you, again, to start training the brain. And I'm going to call this entire presentation, it's a brain game. It really is. My undergrad's in biology. When I first, did, first started doing this graduate work, and I walked in, I won't lie, I walked into my first grad class, they're like, we're going to do a meditation. And I'm like, what the freak have I gotten myself? I'm like, hard science. I'm like, what do you mean we're going to do a meditation? They're like, we're going to breathe. And I remember thinking to myself, hey, you know, I breathe every day. I'm totally good, right? I don't need to do this. And I, I'll never forget, I went home that first day and I said to my husband, 31 years, Army Special Forces retired. I'm like, honey, it, they're a bunch of weirdos. They're like those tree hugger people, right? They go, they breathe, they, they do that namaste, they do all of this stuff. And I remember it was really, really troubling for me until I started looking at the research as to why. And for me, it's, I'm really, really, I need to know the physiology, the psychology behind it, and that's why I do call it a brain game. And just like you were hearing with that yoga breathing, what's it doing? It's moving your nervous system from fight or flight, sympathetic, to parasympathetic, rest and digest. And I'm going to talk about why that's so important in just a little bit. Make sure I have my clicker right. So I always start every slide that I, every, every conference that I do with this slide. What cartoon did this come from? Okay, thank you. Good job. See, the rest of you, if you didn't know, no judgment, but you do have homework. Okay, Kung Fu Panda. Now, in this original Kung Fu Panda, Kung Fu Panda is supposed to be this amazing ninja warrior. Now, those of you who have seen this, does he believe at the beginning that he's an amazing ninja warrior? No, he doesn't, right? He doesn't believe it at all. So Master Ugwe takes him to the, he's a tortoise, by the way. Why is he a tortoise? Where does he live, land or water? He's a tortoise. Where does he live on? Land, good job. If nothing else, you're going to walk away knowing that tortoises are on land, right? So that, that awkward moment later on when you're trying to talk to somebody, did you know a tortoise is on land? But anyways, so Master Igwe takes him to the top of the hill, and he says, listen, you got to get out of your head. You're never going to be what you're capable of being, he goes, unless you can be present. And so he tells him something. I know you've all heard this. And so if you've heard it, and you're like, oh, I want to join in, please do. So he says to him, Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, that's why it's known as the present. Oh, it's like goosebumps, right? Isn't that deep? Like he's telling them, listen, you got get out of your head, you've got to be here and you've got to be now. If you're here and you're now, you're going to be capable of becoming what you need to become. So as we start this, I really want you to think about this. Are you mindful or is your mind full? You get that? I know, it's like really clever, isn't it? Just agree with me. It always works better. Oh, thank you. I thought so, too. So really quickly, again, my name's Jamie Valderrama. I am a full-time lecturer and associate coordinator for the Integrative Health Initiative, ASU. We are housed in the Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions. And I feel incredibly blessed to get to do what I do because I get to bring in my biology and my graduate work is in health modalities. So I get to bring all of this stuff together and look at the physiology and then look at the psychology actually behind it. And what's even more cool is that when I first started, gosh, back in 2008, 2009, we had like two or three of our stress management courses. And we really, we approach everything through mindfulness. Two or three, and we had it, and you know, the college was like, well, you know, the kids like it. It seems like it's helping them. Let me just show you what I have this spring and summer alone. I have got over 3,500 students taking almost 50 sections of these courses. We don't advertise. They come from all four campuses. And what's really, really cool is that they come from all different majors. And this is really rare, because once you get into the college and you get into your major degree program, you start to track with others. But instead, I'll walk into my lecture hall with 60, 70 students in it, and I'll have 20 different majors from biology, sustainability, criminology, I'll have uh, pre-law, I've got teachers, and it's neat because they talk to one another and they're like, wait a minute, you're stressed too? And they're like, yeah, okay, everybody. This isn't just an arena for folks who are in public service because stress is a part of life and learning how to handle it, how to step back, how to deregulate, it's what's gonna create the responsiveness that we look for in our lives that's then gonna drive these really positive behaviors. So these are my undergrads. And then this is what's really cool. We have graduate courses, 
And one of the newest ones we have is that critical incident. It's called critical, critical incident stress management, but it is not the same as you would see going through like the police department. This is a course that Homeland Security and emergency, emergency Management came up to us and said, hey, we want to have a unique program. We want to not only be teaching the folks in this graduate program how to handle all of these different disasters, but also how to deal with themselves. This is very unique. We haven't seen that around the country. So we want them, we know that first responders are excellent when there's a crisis. That's what your job is. But where we see the issues are the days, the weeks, and the months after when the proper processing hasn't occurred. And that's when we start seeing self-abuse behaviors. We start seeing issues with family dynamics. They're like, can you create a course? And we're like, absolutely. And by the way, I don't know if you're aware, I think a lot of you might be, that their Homeland Security and Emergency Management Program at ASU was just named number one in the country. So obviously, they're doing something right by bringing this in. So I was a little, I, I won't lie, I was a little hesitant going, OK, I've got to work with a lot of first responders. They're going to come in, and I'm going to be hitting them with, well, why are all these different meditative practices really good for you? But they came in, and they embraced it. And in fact, I had one 30-year veteran of the police department say, Jamie, why wasn't I taught this when I was at the police academy? And it's because we just didn't have all the data out there yet. It's more acceptable now. It was like me when I walked into that first grad class going, what do you mean we're going to breathe? That's like woo-woo, weird stuff, right? But now we've got the science and the literature behind it showing the neuroplasticity or how it actually changes the brain when we engage in these different behaviors. And what's really interesting, so we have this course. We have eight courses alone this spring and summer. And I started getting these emails from these other grad cohorts from law, from the, the doctoral nurse practitioners, from counseling and psychology. And they're like, hey, we're hearing about this really cool grad course. Can we take it too? I'm like, yeah, why not? So now I've got courses that are so interesting. because so I'll have DMPs in there. I'll have counseling and psychology. I'll have MSWs. I'll have police, fire, military. And everybody's talking from a different perspective. And it's incredibly powerful to see it. And again, these are all the different majors we have now, grad majors coming into this program with our first responders. Why is this so successful? All the data that we have that stress, when you come in and you leave, it doesn't change, right? Stress is part of life. But what we do see a change in is happiness and empathy. We basically increase the depth of the toolbox of responsive behaviors. That's it. We're educating people on how they can move forward positively. So I'm back to this. Are you mindful or is your mind full? And I got to tell you, I had a student once write in her evaluation. She said, this was the easiest course I've taken at ASU, and it was the hardest course I've taken at ASU. It's the easiest course because it was all about me. It's the hardest course because it's all about me. That can be incredibly uncomfortable. When you wake up in the morning, I'm sure if we feel good or excited, we wake up and we're like, I feel really good, right? I feel great. My body feels good. How many of you wake up in the morning, maybe you're feeling some anxiety or depression, and you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm anxious today. This is really nice, right? Like, I really, we don't, right? We're like, oh, oh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. And so we want to either distract ourselves, sometimes we numb it. But really the challenge here when we look at mindfulness is that you purposely pay attention to it, all of it. Because you can't have the positive emotions without the negative or what you perceive as your negative emotions. So what is mindfulness? It's the simplest definition out there. It's purposely paying attention with acceptance or without judgment. Be honest, how many people in here in the brief amount of time that I've been talking have already thought about something else. Maybe what you're going to have for lunch, right? When I talked about coffee earlier, you're like, oh, I really need to go get a frappuccino. Or did anybody do that? Yeah. It's the way our brains work. Of course you do that. Your brain is never going to be totally silent. Mindfulness is catching the brain and paying attention to where the brain is actually taking you. So, oh, this is my favorite part. I'm going to go back one. When I go to the next slide, because I love crowd interaction. It makes it a lot of fun. When I go to the next slide, everybody has to go, why is this important? And I'm going to tell you, the hand motions really help. They really do. It, it'll, it'll buffer up the volume. OK, everybody ready? OK, here we go. OK, I got to tell you, that was pretty good. That really was. Hand motions, there's a lot of passion over on this side of the room. Let's try a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit louder. Here we go. Well, you guys, thank you for asking me that. I'm so glad you want to know. It's important because another study out of Harvard showed that about half of our day, the average American is lost in thought. Think about that. 47% of our day, lost in thought. 
That's quite a bit. And it's interesting because you've trained your brain. Now, this is a brain game. You have trained it to go to a certain route or a certain neural connection that you've strengthened. So what happens is at the end of the day, when you're not talking to your buddies, when you're, when you're done with the calls, when you can actually sit in their silence, your brain tends to default to a couple of different modes. One can be it ruminates, rumination. Rumination means that you sit down and you start thinking about everything from the past. It could be short term, it could be long term. And when I say past, I'm saying detrimental as far as maybe you're going over and over a situation that you no longer have control over. It was a bad conversation, it was a fight, but you still allow it to go on and on and on. Has that ever happened to anybody? Anybody at all right where we get that? And it's interesting because clinically when we do this, it leads to depression. So if somebody is constantly in a ruminative state, and it's not bad to think about the past as far as learning, we're talking about thinking about the past when it creates negative storylines that pull us away from being present and doing what we need to do. But when we constantly do this, we've strengthened our brain to ruminate. It's like if you go to the gym and all you do is bicep curls, well, you're going to strengthen the biceps, right? So you can't sit there and go, why can't I be present when and it's your triceps and you've never worked the triceps? It's the same thing here. You're creating these really strong neural connections to rumination. Some of you, the minute it gets quiet, it's not rumination that occurs, but it's projection, right? We start thinking about the future. Now, what is projection? What can it lead to clinically? I have a hint up here. What is that? Anxiety, right? Like, look at that poor tea. What if I taste weird? Like, what if I'm too hot? What if I'm just right and I can never live up to it again, right? Have you ever played the what if game? The minute you sit there and you're like, what if I can't do this call? What if this relationship doesn't work out? What if I can't pay this bill? What if, what if, what if? Clinically, it leads to anxiety. Now, I had a student a few semesters come, ago come in. She did first day class. She'd just come in with another friend. They'd come from a math class. It was like a stats class. And they're sitting here, and they're looking at the syllabus. And the one student's looking and going to her friend, do you know that there are only three tests in this class? Three tests. And she goes, what if I don't pass one of them? And she's talking to her, what, well, if I don't pass, what, what if I don't pass this class? What if I don't pass this class? And this kid had gone from zero to living under a bridge in Tempe in like 30 seconds, right? She, as far as she was concerned, she wasn't graduating. All because of a syllabus. Have you ever done that? She had induced, she had, she had created this storyline that had never even, hadn't even happened yet, but had already derailed her life. And Mark Twain has this really cool quote. It goes along the lines that most of the tragedies that have occurred in our lives are those we've made up. Isn't that kind of true? And so I thought they're looking at her going, oh, man, I'm glad you're in this class, right? I'm like, going, this is crazy. So that was her becoming very anxious. And some of you are like, oh, Jamie, 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 let me tell you, I can do both. I'm really good at this, right? I can be depressed and anxious at the same time, right? And so, you know, the goal is, there, there's no judgment here. The goal is recognizing that you have the empowerment or the ability to catch the brain and start making change. It takes time, takes work, anything that's valuable does, correct? But it's you, mindfulness, purposely paying attention. It's you saying, wait a minute, I'm projecting. Okay, what can I do to weaken that connection and then come back to my present moment? Because my present moment, all the literature shows us, when our brain is in present, we're the happiest. We do the best personally, professionally. It's when we're right here. And so just like you saw with the breathing exercises, JT, when he said, listen, you come back. It helps you. That little simple breathing exercise will help you come back. You're having these projective thoughts, the what ifs, or you're thinking about the past. And again, it's you saying, well, wait a minute. I don't have to be here. I can weaken these connections, and I can strengthen my connection to the present moment. And that's what this is all about. How do we do that, and how do we learn to really, really pay attention to ourselves? Oh, OK, you know how this works. OK, you guys ready? I love this. OK, everybody's ready, right? Check with your tables. Everybody looks good. OK, here we go. Here we go. OK, I'm done. That was beautiful. I can just leave now. Thank you. Now, I'm so glad you asked me that question again. Well, we train the brain, right? This is all about training the brain. So have you ever been here? It's that perfect selfie moment with your friends. You're like, oh, life is good. I have everything under control. Bills are paid, emails are answered, I'm good. And then all of a sudden, it's not good, right? Have we, have we been there? And it's crazy because we all do this. Think about it. How many people have said, man, if I can just get through this shift, my life will be so much easier? Have we done that? If I can get through the next two weeks, my life will be so much easier. If I can just get through all the students this class, my life will be so much easier. Has anybody ever said that? 
Yeah, does it get that much easier? No, no, it doesn't. And that's where we talk about stress doesn't lead. There's nothing wrong with stress. Stress can actually be really advantageous for us. It's learning how to approach it and how to control stress rather than letting stress control you. So I like to show this as a very simplistic model of the triune brain by Paul McLean. And it really just breaks the brain down into three major regions. The reptilian, which is the brainstem, right? Oldest portion, that's why it's called brain, the reptilian. The limbic is second oldest, also known as mammalian. And by the way, the reptilian contains your autonomic features, heart rate, respiration. Limbic is emotional regulation. The amygdala is located there. And then our newest is going to be the neocortex, right? Critical thinking. What age does that neocortex fully develop? About 25. Yeah, 25, 26. Anybody ever seen a teenager like you've seen them before? Yeah, they're these elusive creatures that slam doors and stomp away. Have you seen those? Yeah, very, can be very reactive. It's interesting, I work with a lot of teachers too, and I tell them, especially high school, middle school and high school. It's interesting, when a teenager is at that age, that limbic region, that emotional regulation, it's there, it's fully developed. They have a beautiful limbic system. But guess what's not fully developed? That neocortex. So that reactive behavior we sometimes see, literally teenagers will never feel with the intensity that they're feeling right now because they don't have that cognitive reasoning to completely kind of temper it down. Now, it doesn't make behavior correct, but I think it sometimes makes it a little bit more understandable. I'll tell you, I have a 17-year-old actually has turned 18, and she's kind of getting out of that finally. And there are times that she'll just like, she'll fling her hair and stomp up the stairs, right? And I'm just like, oh, it's that neocortex and that limbic. It'll, it'll happen soon. And then I'll do my breathing, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And it's interesting. When I do my breathing with her, she's lived with me. So she'll turn around and go, oh, are you going to breathe now? Now, that you don't see me in prison doing this is something that I think is, is hugely showing how responsive I have been. So if we look at this, though, I like showing this because we want to see all three regions. I know some of you guys are like, oh, oh, she wouldn't live. <laughs> it's like, but all three regions of the brain balanced. When we see this, the nervous system's in something called parasympathetic, rest or digest, right? So we're sleeping really well. Um, our digestive tract's working really well. We're pooping really well. I'm going to tell you, as I get older, sleep and that, that's it. If I, both those things are happening for me, I'm good at that point. But it, it's where everything's going good. We're very, very responsive. Now, anti-sympathetic, I'm parasympathetic, is another very important system, right? It's sympathetic. It's fight or flight. And this is here to protect us or to keep us alive. Now, look what happens. This is interesting. See the brain in parasympathetic, how we have connection between all three regions. They're talking to one another. When we go into sympathetic, the neocortex becomes disengaged. Now, this is important. Think about this. There's a reason for it. If we all walked out of here today, and there were that horde of zombies coming after us, does your brain want you to be like, why are there zombies here today? Does that make any sense? Yeah, and then he eats you, right? right? Your brain's like, what does your brain want you to do? Run. Run. It wants you to get away. It's like, friend, we can process this later, right? We are getting out of here, right? And as we're getting away, look what happens. Two very important systems get put on the back burner, digestive and immune, because they're not needed for immediate survival. So your body's like, let's just get out of here now. When we're safe, we'll return to homeostasis. We can critically think about this entire scenario at that point. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, that's great if there's a bear chasing us. There is, right? <laughs> but if it's life and we're chronically stressed, this isn't great. I mean, who wants to have their immune system, digestive system? Think about doctor's visits. They, they actually project that like 75 to 90 percent of doctor's visits are for stress-related complaints and disorders. My stomach hurts. I've got diarrhea. I'm constipated. I'm getting sick all the time. I'm not sleeping, right? And that's why the law school, what's going on in your life? Now, think about your lives. Now, do you have a little bit of stress sometimes? That phone call stressed me out, right? And so I can, yeah, you have a lot of stress. So recognizing what your body is doing is key. I have a friend who's a psychiatrist, and he's like, Jamie, if people would just stop and pay attention to what their body's telling them, they would never need another self-help book. They wouldn't. Because what did I remember that, 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 those stats from Harvard? 47% of our day lost in thought. 47% of our day not paying attention to what your body's trying to tell you. The minute you're getting upset, the minute you're getting triggered, whether it's through anxiety, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're hurt, your body tells you. What happens when we start to get upset? What's our heart rate do? It elevates, right? Our breathing increases. Sometimes our throat closes up a little bit. Our stomach feels like it has a lead weight in it. Sometimes we shake, right? 
we clench. The body's like, listen, I'm going into it, I'm going into this heightened alert system. Now, if you're paying attention to it, you have an opportunity if this is something like traffic or your kids or work, you have an opportunity to say, okay, wait, I don't need to go there. Because if I go there, I disengage that neocortex, I become very reactive, and I'm no longer responsive. Recognizing that the body's moving into this, being mindful, teaches you to say, oh, let me step back for a minute. Let me do some breathing exercises like you were just shown. Let me deregulate back to parasympathetic so that I can be responsive. And I do this all the time. I go into school districts. A lot of kids have, what do they have when they take tests? They have test anxiety. Guess what's going to happen with test anxiety? They're disconnecting the neocortex. I don't care how long they've studied. They're not going to have full access there. Little simple things to do to help you get the brain back in balance is what's going to help you to actually be able to be everything that you're capable of being. So we know that stress is not good, it's not bad, it's just life. So we're back here. And it's like, how do we do this? How do we work on maintaining that balance in the brain so that we can stay in that parasympathetic state when we need to stay there? And so we do it via mindfulness. And I love this next clip. Maybe we'll see if it, there it goes. There's a story, usually attributed to the Native American tradition, which illuminates different ways of paying attention. An elder, talking to a child, says, I have two wolves fighting in my heart. One wolf is fearful, vengeful, envious, resentful, and deceitful. The other wolf is compassionate, loving, generous, truthful, and peaceful. 